J-E-L-L-O. The Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with you walked by. Friends, there's one statement I think explains better than any other just why those new Jell-O puddings are so popular everywhere. It's simply this. Jell-O puddings are made by the makers of Jell-O, so you'll know they're good. People know that when they see the name Jell-O, they can expect the best. And when they take their first taste of Jell-O puddings, they find those same expectations fulfilled to the last degree. Because Jell-O puddings, ladies and gentlemen, offer you the same high quality, the same delightful goodness, the same easy preparation and economy that has made Jell-O a 40-year favorite of the American family. Jell-O puddings are delicious puddings that take only a few ticks of the clock to make. Simply add milk, cook for about five minutes, and cool. And you're all ready to sit down to one of the grandest puddings anybody ever tasted. So try these rich, creamy Jell-O puddings real soon in all three flavors, chocolate, vanilla, and butterscotch. The very next time you ask your grocer for Jell-O, ask him for Jell-O puddings, too. You just can't imagine a finer treat than smooth, luscious Jell-O puddings. played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to present a man I have been associated with for many years and whom I am proud to call my friend. Oh, sure. He invites his friend over to his house and leaves his friend standing out in the rain. Hmm. A man whose generosity and forgiving nature permits him to harbor no grudge against anyone. Anyone but you. You don't have to give me that soft soap. I was in bed with a cold for a week. Now, Jack, please. I bring you a man who always... A man who, a man who... Get it over with, you big, fat hypocrite. <laughs> well, go ahead. Jack, if you don't stop interrupting, I won't introduce you at all. Well, wouldn't that be a tragedy? I think I'll tie my shoelaces together and hang myself. <laughs> he won't introduce me. Boo, hoo, hoo. Oh, nuts! Goodbye! <laughs> hmm. You hear the way he slammed the door, Mary? Yeah. Darn near broke it. I'm going to tell Mr. Swallow, the boss of NBC, on him. Why, Jack, you're the biggest baby I ever saw. Imagine being mad at Wilson. Well, who wouldn't be? She's right, Jackson. Why don't you and Don kiss and make up? I wouldn't kiss Don Wilson if I was a French general. <laughs> you know, you fellas can talk because none of you suffered. But I was in bed a whole week with a cold. A cold, he says. <laughs> That's what it was, Dennis, a very severe cold. And my physician said that if I didn't have such a rugged constitution, I never would have pulled through. Oh, what does that horse doctor know? Dr. Leroy treats human beings, too. <laughs> Although I wish he'd stop calling my legs withers. <laughs> anyway, I'm just lucky that I have such a strong physique. You sure have, Jack. You're built like a football player. Oh, I wouldn't say that. All right, a football. Now don't be silly, Mary, because I've got a wonderful build I'll unbutton my shirt and show you Don't bother It's no bother There, there you are Get a load of that chest What's that running through it, Benedict Canyon? <laughs> now wait a minute, Phil, before you take a bow on that You know all those physical culture magazines that you see on the newsstands? Well, just a few years ago, I used to pose for those muscle ads. Ah, oh, don't give me that stuff. That's the truth. I used to pose for muscle ads, didn't I, Mary? Only your head. <laughs> My body, too. What about that picture of me in a leopard skin where I was hanging from a trapeze by my teeth? Yeah, that was a swell set. What the ever became of them? <laughs> oh, Mary, you're so funny. I'll bet you used to keep the girls in stitches at the May Company. <laughs> You know, Mary, sometimes I wonder if... Well, he's back again. Did you forget something, Mr. Wilson? No, I just came back to see if you'd calm down enough to get the show started. 
Calm down. You were the one that walked out, not me. Well, who wouldn't? You've been treating me as though the whole thing was my fault. Well, I'll be... Don, let's go back two weeks ago tonight. <laughs> if you remember, we were all standing where we are right now, weren't we? I was standing over there by the piano. All right, the piano. <laughs> now, if you remember, Don, you said... I want you all to come over to the house and meet my wife. Is that right? Yes, but I... Bill, is that correct? Sure, but why now, the... Now, Mary, you heard the entire conversation, didn't you? Oh, Jack, if you don't... You heard every word of it. Now, what did I say to Don Wilson when he invited us to his house? You said, call up your wife. That's exactly what I said. Call her up, you said. If I said it once, I said it five times. Let's not barge in on the little woman. Now, well, would you listen to me, Don? Now, wait a minute, No, Jack. you had to be a wise guy. Oh, what's the use? Goodbye. In and out, in and out. <laughs> if he thinks he's going to get paid for tonight, he's crazy. <laughs> he better be careful the way he's slamming that door. Say, Jack, you ought to stop being so silly and make up with Don. What'll the sponsor think? Oh, he'll never know unless somebody tells him. <laughs> Don't worry. You mean the sponsor never listens to our program? Oh, once in a while. Then why do I go to the trouble of making those terrific musical arrangements? They cost me a fortune. Phil, any money you spend on your musical arrangements should be spent on having your head examined. <laughs> now, how about playing one of your beautiful arrangements right now? Okay, what would you like to hear? I can play anything from Wagner to Schmagner. Well, I recognize Wagner as a great composer, Phil, but who is Schmagner? Hotlick Schmagner. He's my trumpet player. <laughs> oh, does Hotlick write songs, too? Sure, he wrote a lot of things. Dreamboat Serenade, the La Brea Pit Stomp. Hmm, what else? Well, he wrote, when the bluebirds come back to Blueberry Hill, I'll be blue, oh, so blue, over you, Sue. <laughs> you went right through the chorus with that, didn't you? <laughs> Well, that trumpet player of yours is original, isn't he? Yeah. He wrote another thing called I Dream of Jeannie with the Light Brown Hair. Now, wait a minute. Stephen Foster wrote I Dream of Jeannie with the Light Brown Hair. Well, this one is H-A-R-E. She's got a rabbit with her all the time. <laughs> oh, the Light Brown Belgian Hair, I see. Well, go ahead, Phil. Play anything. Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes. Now, this may surprise you, but there was a song written about me, too. What is it? I dream of Jeannie with no hair at all. Goodbye. <laughs> you know, I've seen an orange with a better pompadour than he's got. Play, Phil. Humor Man, played by Phil Harris and his Happy Go Lucky Orchestra. Happy meaning they're a bunch of jolly good fellows, go meaning they're always on the job, raring to go, and lucky meaning boy are they. <laughs> and that goes for Schmogner, too. 
Bad humor, man. Say, Phil, uh, you played that number about four weeks ago, didn't you? Yeah, I like to ring them bells. Well, you did it beautifully. You know, Phil, if you ever sell ice cream bars, and I think you will. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> uh, you'll, <laughs> you'll be all set. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I have a very important announcement to make, and that is that next Sunday night, our broadcast will come to you from New York City. You know, fellas, we're uh, leaving tomorrow. Oh, boy, New York, nightclubs, women. Dennis, your mother's going with you. Oh, boy, New York, the aquarium, Grant's tomb. <laughs> That's more like it. You know, I'm uh, thrilled myself. I always get a kick out of New York. I really dissipate there. Look who dissipates, whether yeah. it's New York, Hollywood, or Waukegan. Benny's in bed by 10 o'clock. No, I am, eh? Well, what about last year when you, Phil Harris, and I went to the store club? We stayed and stayed and stayed till the place closed. Sure, Phil wouldn't pick up the check either. <laughs> That's so. Then poor Dennis walked in and you made him pass. That was a fine for catching him up so late. And besides, I straightened it out with Dennis later. He gave me three Peruvian stamps. How do I know they're worth $45? <laughs> Never mind, big boy. Huh? Say, uh... uh, uh <laughs> big boy yet yeah, to Dennis, huh? Say, Jackson, I meant to tell you, I don't think I'll be able to go to New York with you. Why not? Well, I can't leave night school. I'll get too far behind. Oh, you and your night school. It won't hurt you to give it up for a couple of weeks. Ah, nothing doing. Take history, for instance. History? Yeah. I'm up to Napoleon at Waterloo, and I want to see how it comes out. <laughs> Phil, Napoleon lost at Waterloo. Says you. Says me, says everybody else, and your book, if you'd open it. <laughs> Napoleon lost. Well, I guess all I can do is pay up. Pay up? Yeah, I bet a guy across the aisle eight to five, he'd win. <laughs> well, you should have got seven points on that. <laughs> Too bad you lost, Phil. Oh, that's all right. I cleaned up on Dewey at Manila. <laughs> you're the only guy I know of who would make book on history. Anyway, you're going to New York with us, so start packing. And if you think of it, take along one suit where the coat matches the pants. Do they come that way? Yes, believe me. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen... Oh, he's here again. Yes, I'm here again. <laughs> now, listen, Don Wilson, I'm going to tell Mr. Swallow, the boss of NBC, the way you've been slamming that door every time you go out. You do, and I'll tell him you put a slug in the apple machine. Slug nothing. It was a buffalo nickel. It was a slug. It was a buffalo nickel. Then how come it said good for one beer on it? Because the buffalo was thirsty and shut up. <laughs> Anyhow, you're nothing but a big fat tattletale. I resent that. Goodbye. There he goes again. Say, Jack, you better make up with Don or he won't go to New York with you. Who cares? He'd probably squash Dennis anyway. Squash Dennis? You mean you've got them in the same berth? I'm running this trip. <laughs> Donna sharing a berth with Dennis. Phil, you're bunking with me. And Mary, you're going to have a berth all by yourself. That's mighty wide of you. <laughs> Just be glad you're going along. Hey, wait a minute. I thought of something else, Jackson. If I go to New York, I can't be in our night school play. Your night school play? Yeah, we're putting on a Christmas fantasy. Oh, brother. Guess what part do you play in this fantasy, Phil? I'm a shrub. <laughs> You're... you're a what? I'm a shrub, a shrub. One of them little guys with wings. That's a terror! <laughs> a shrub. <laughs> now, Phil, you're going... you're coming to New York with us and somebody else can wear those wings. The premiere of Love Thy Neighbor is a little more important than a night school play. Jack, look. There he is, Mr. Swallow. <laughs> What? Well, I'll be... Oh, hello, Mr. Swallow. Listen, Jack, what's this I hear about you putting a slug in the apple machine? See you later, Wilson. <laughs> now, Mr. Swallow, that wasn't a slug at all. It was a buffalo nickel. Buffalo schmuffalo. Don't put him in the machine. <laughs> Okay, okay. And another thing, Jack. I wish you wouldn't park your Maxwell in front of this nice new building. There's a parking lot next door. They refused it. They did not. 
All right, Mr. Swallow, I'll put it on the lot. I hope you're satisfied. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> he thinks Bob Hope is the funniest guy in the world. That's why he's mad at me. <laughs> that reminds me, I got a bone to pick with him, too. What do you sort Bob Hope for, Jackson? I know why. Never mind. He told Brandon Cabina not to go out with Jack. <laughs> I never asked those two dames for a date in my life. Although Brenda's made several passes at me. <laughs> and Kobe, too. <laughs> well, Mr. Wilson, I suppose you're proud of yourself. Now, if you haven't anything else to expose, you can go home to the little woman. Tattle to her, too. Well, before I go, I've got a job here, and I'm going to do it. All right, go ahead and do it. Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies the next time you're in the mood for attempting an appetizing dessert, why don't you go to your neighborhood grocer and ask him for a package of Jell-O? What do you think they're going to ask for, a girdle? <laughs> Some surprise, a package of Jell-O. Hmm. It's not only economical and easy to make, but comes in six delicious flavors. Strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, 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 and lime. lime. I know that, too. Another surprise. Quiet, you! Go on, you tattletale. So always look for the big red letters on the tattletale. Goodbye! <laughs> oh, boy, is he burned up. There's a guy that really can't take it. I think it's a shame the way you're treating Mr. Wilson. Oh, you do, you little trainer. You little traitor. <laughs> well, just... <laughs> Those are my bifocals. <laughs> Just sing your number, and I'll do the thinking around here. Now, what's it gonna be? One of Mr. Schmagner's latest songs. Oh, no, you're not. You sing what you're supposed to. Okay. Now, go ahead. I never thought that Wilson would turn out to be a stool pigeon. <laughs> Rotary luncheon, army and navy game. Darling, any place would be the same. Here in the city, out in the country, up in the land of Oz. Darling, wouldn't matter where it was. Cause I'd know you anywhere I'd know that grin I'd know you anywhere When you walked in I would tingle with a single glance in your eyes Watching the starlight in your eyes Oh, you saw my vacant stare You understood I'd love you anywhere Honest, I would I was certain this would happen Strangers I'd Know You Anywhere from Kay Kaiser's new picture sung by Dennis Day. And just think, Dennis, next week you'll be singing from New York City 3,000 miles away. Let's go to Peru. I want to cash in those stamps. I'll give you a good pinch if you don't watch out. You know, it's pretty cold back east, Dennis, so I advise you to take along some warm underwear. You'll need them. Are you going to take long underwear with you, Mr. Benny? Take them. He's wearing them now. <laughs> You're only guessing, Mary. The underwear I happen to have on only goes to my knees. Yeah, but when we hit Chicago, you'll roll them down. <laughs> you said it. I'm not going to catch another cold. You saw what happened to me two weeks ago. Hey, Jackson, are you going to take your coonskin cap to New York? Oh, sure. If it's cold enough, I'll wear it. Even to the premiere? If it's cold enough. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha! 
If it's cold <laughs> enough, I'll wear it. I can just see the sign in front of the theater. Love Thy Neighbor, starring Fred Allen and Kit Carson. Mary, in the first place, I don't look anything like Kit Carson. And in the second place, don't mention Fred Allen's name in connection with the picture. Stooges don't get billing. I don't blame you for being mad at him, Mr. Benny, after that gag he pulled about you Wednesday night. What was it? I heard it. Alan said you were so low you could read by the light of a hot foot. <laughs> Very amusing. Uh, who laughed louder at the joke, Phil, Alan or the audience? Alan. I thought so. You know, Alan is the only comic in radio who can think of a joke, tell it, laugh at it, then run out in the middle of the broadcast and send himself a wire saying, even better than last week. <laughs> You know, he doesn't need a studio audience at all. Then why does he have so many people there? He sells them hot dogs during the commercials. <laughs> Quite a sideline for him. Come in. Hey, Jack, here comes your veterinary. Mary, I told you he's not just a vet. Hello, Doc. Well, well, and how's my little man this beautiful, beautiful day? <laughs> your little man is finesy winesy. I told you, Doc, I don't need you anymore. My cold is cured. Now, now, don't be too sure. I am sure. I had a cold in my chest and it's gone. Oh, that's silly. It must be around here someplace. <laughs> oh, go away, will you, Doc? I'm all cured and I feel great. While he's here, Jack, why don't you let him look you over? Mary, I don't need a doctor anymore. I tell you, I feel... I feel... <laughs> Fine. There, you see, you're still coughing. That's a sneeze. Oh, that's right. Sneezing is with the nose and coughing is with the mouth. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> now, please go away. Well, before I go, I'll have to give you a cold shot. That'll prevent you from sneezing again. Now, Doc, I haven't time for a shot. I'll just fill my hypodermic needle. You're not going to stick that needle in me. Oh, let him, Jack. He knows what he's doing. Yeah, but I don't need it, Mary. I'm okay. Now, hold still and I'll put this needle right in your arm. Wait till I roll up my sleeve. <laughs> saw such an impatient... Uh, there. Easy now. This won't hurt a bit. Here we go. Now, Doc... <laughs> Ooh, my arm. There, that'll fix you up fine. Now, that didn't hurt, did it? Did too. My arm hurts like anything. Should I kiss it for you? <laughs> Don't bother. All right, I'll drop around tomorrow and see how you feel. Goodbye. Goodbye. Hey, wait a minute. Aren't you going to take the needle out of my arm? <laughs> Pull it out. Oh, yes. I lose more darn needles that way. <laughs> Too bad. Now, hold still. <laughs> oh. There we are. Goodbye, Mr. Benny. See you tomorrow. I don't need you anymore. That's what Errol Flynn said, and the next day his beagle hound had pups. <laughs> You're an absent-minded doctor. Well, it's your own fault, Jack. Why don't you get a real physician? Listen, Mary, Dr. Leroy brought Carmichael through the measles so he can certainly take care of my little cold. He's just forgetful, that's all. Well, here comes Malicious again. <laughs> You find any more things to tattle to, Mr. Swallow? Now, Jack, let's stop acting like a couple of babies and make up. You're the baby, not me. Gee, after all, we've got to go to New York together, and I'm all broken up about this. Oh, yeah. Come on, Jack, this is the first yeah. fight we've ever had. Let's bury the hatchet and shake hands. Well, I'll make up with you on one condition. What's that? That the next time I say to you, Don, don't you think you ought to call up your wife? Call her up! <laughs> That's all I ask. Oh, I will, Jack, I promise. Okay, Don, I forgive you. Now, fellas, we're all leaving from the Union Station tomorrow night. And I want you all lined up at gate number nine, so when I call the roll, there won't be any confusion. That goes for you too, Wilson. Okay. Now, Mary, you bring the sandwiches. Uh, Dennis, you bring the potato salad. And Phil... I'll bring a jar of ants. We might as well make a picnic out of it. <laughs> you bring a thermos bottle full of coffee. I'll take it. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny, this is Rochester. What do you want? I've been packing for our trip to New York, and you know that tweed suit you want to take along? Yes. Remember you told me to press the pants? Uh-huh. Well, you've got an odd coat now. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, my goodness. Rochester, why is it you're always burning my pants? It's that gas platter on. You ought to take the tip from Edison. <laughs> Never saw anyone so careless. Now, Rochester, it's going to be pretty cold in the east. So I want you to pack my big, heavy overcoat. That overcoat's pretty old, boss. And besides, we haven't got room in the trunk. It's not so old. And if the trunk is full, wrap up the coat and send it parcel post. Parcel post? Yes. There's enough moths in it to fly airmail. <laughs> well, that coat wouldn't be in such bad shape if you'd put moth balls in it like I told you to. Moth balls wouldn't scare them moths away. They would, too. I threw a handful in there, and what they didn't eat, they juggled. <laughs> Oh, stop. Now, Rochester, one more thing. When we get to New York, I'm going to hit all the hot spots. You know, I'll be stepping out a lot. Stepping out, he says. <laughs> well, I will be. So I want you to pack my white tie, top hat, and tails. You mean tails. I mean tails. That's tail, boss. One of them got caught in the trunk. <laughs> Well, pack it anyway. I can have it fixed in New York. We go through Waukegan, my father can fix it. <laughs> now, that's... <laughs> now, that's about all. I'll see you later. Goodbye, Rochester. Goodbye. Wait a minute. Here's something else, Rochester. Be sure and pack my coonskin cap. I'll need that. I meant to tell you, boss, I'm having a little trouble with that coonskin. What's wrong? Well, for one thing, I can't catch it. Now, cut that out. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> I like to travel just once without trouble. Now, where was I? Oh, yes. Now, listen, fellas, remember, everybody be at the station tomorrow night on time. And so we don't have any duplications. Mary, you bring the Cosmopolitan... Phil, you bring the Esquire. Dennis, you bring the Red Book. Wilson, you bring the American Magazine, and I'll get Liberty in the Saturday Evening Post. And we'll... You've probably noticed, ladies and gentlemen, that after the most successful stage plays have finished their first run, they're very often brought back by popular demand for a return engagement. Well, the same thing is true of desserts. Take Jell-O's newest dessert recipe, jellied figs. Now there's something the whole family will want to enjoy as a regular treat because it's so good looking and so delicious. And since you'll have to serve it again and again, you'll be glad to hear that it's mighty easy to make. Just prepare one package of strawberry jello as usual and chill until slightly thickened. Fold in one cup of sliced stewed figs. Then mold and serve plain or with whipped cream. The result is a rich, tempting dessert, simple yet clever, delicious and yet very inexpensive. And by the way, if you haven't enjoyed strawberry jello recently, try it soon. You'll find it better than ever because strawberry jello, like raspberry jello, has a new improved flavor obtained by using a natural flavor base artificially enhanced. And that's one reason strawberry jello has such a grand extra goodness. So get a package tomorrow and make this swell blend of sweet, juicy figs and bright, rosy pink strawberry jello. <laughs> This is the last number of the 10th program of the current Jell-O series, and we'll be with you next Sunday night broadcasting from the Ritz Theater in New York City. Good night, folks. <laughs> How disturbing those sounds are when you're lying in bed at night sleepless. And how often you are sleepless because you drank ordinary coffee instead of Sanka coffee. Sanka coffee has the sleep-disturbing caffeine taken out. And it's wonderfully mellow and fragrant. It's real coffee. So drink Sanka and you'll never lose a wink of sleep. Sanka coffee presents We the People over another network every Tuesday evening. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>